Author Evelyn Beatrice Hall best captured the principle behind free speech when she wrote, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. But do Americans really believe that? Here's David Pogue. When someone says something we disagree with, should we shut them up? In 1927, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis had an answer. The remedy to be applied, he wrote, is more speech, not enforced silence. Well, in that case, the internet should have solved everything. It's nothing but more speech. And yet, lately, the news is full of stories about people trying to limit other people's expression. A proposed bill would regulate classroom discussion on race. Ban most discussions of sexuality and gender identity in schools. The Tennessee School Board under fire for removing a Holocaust novel from its curriculum. Spotify taking heat once again over its most popular podcaster, Joe Rogan. A new Georgetown Law Administrator has not even started his job yet, but he's already facing calls to be fired. I would argue that the culture of free speech uh, is under attack in the U.S. And without a robust culture of free speech based on tolerance, the laws and constitutional protection will ultimately erode. Jakob Mishangama is the author of a new book that documents the history of free speech. People both on the left and the right are uh, sort of coming at free speech from different angles with different grievances that point to a general loss of faith in the First Amendment. The free speech erosion is even happening in schools. Since January last year, Republican lawmakers have introduced more than 150 state laws that would restrict how teachers can discuss race, sexual orientation, and gender identity in the classroom. It's about making up false narratives to further a political goal of your own. Jennifer Given teaches high school history in Hollis, New Hampshire. It's a really scary time to be a teacher. We're self-censoring. We are absolutely avoiding certain things and ideas in an effort to stay within the lines as best we understand them. In New Hampshire, a new law limits what teachers can say about racism and sexism, and a conservative group is offering a $500 bounty to anyone who turns in a teacher who violates it. The ghost of Senator McCarthy is alive and well in some of our state house hallways. What would happen to you if you did step afoul of this law? That can result in the loss of your license. And so I would not only be unemployable at my school, but I would be unemployable anywhere. But what I don't understand is this is New Hampshire whose motto is live free or die. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of emphasis on the or die part of late. <laughs> That's a very serious freedom of speech issue. To me, that is so far off the rail. UC Berkeley professor John Powell is an expert on civil liberties and democracy. He's especially alarmed at the record number of books that are being banned in schools all over the country. Conservatives object to books about sex, gender issues, and racial injustice and liberals object to books containing outdated racial depictions. You know, you can't make the Holocaust a nice thing. <laughs> it wasn't a nice thing. You can't make slavery a nice thing. That makes people uncomfortable. It should make people uncomfortable. The goal of education is not comfort. So if someone really wants to challenge the Holocaust, let them challenge it. But don't ban a discussion on it. In the mid-1800s, English philosopher John Stuart Mill proposed that governments limit free speech only when it would cause harm to others. He wrote a book called On Liberty, On Freedom, and he was very concerned of the government silencing people, that citizens had to have the right to express themselves. Our laws have generally followed that guideline. In the U.S., public speech can't include obscenity, defamation, death threats, incitement to violence, harms. To this day, I can't swear on broadcast TV or strip completely naked. Sorry, folks. But Powell says that the recent restrictions have more to do with culture wars than with preventing harm. I want to regulate that because I don't like it. To me, that's wrong. That's problematic. So there's a difference between saying something that makes you uncomfortable and saying something that damages society or incites to riot. Right. 
And, and discomfort is not the same as an injury. But these days, there are entire new categories of speech that can lead to harm. Now there's a concept of disinformation, where you deliberately engage in lies, in, in fact, to cause harm, to cause injury, to exclude some people. But what it really means is that our understanding of the First Amendment and our understanding of free speech is evolving. It has to evolve. It's probably no coincidence that the new censorship culture arose simultaneously with social networks like Facebook and Twitter. The First Amendment was conceived as a protection of citizens from restriction of expression by the government and not by private companies or other entities. Jillian York is the Director for International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and she's written a book of her own. So, for example, Donald Trump getting kicked off of Twitter and Facebook, is that censorship? Is that bad censorship? Is that good censorship? I think Trump getting kicked off of Facebook and Twitter is kind of complicated. But the thing that really concerns me the most is that someone like Mark Zuckerberg, whom none of us elected, has the power to remove an elected official. I think that should really worry us, even if we do feel that Trump should be silenced. York says that the big tech companies censor our speech every day, sometimes by mistake, but always without supervision or transparency. We saw protest content around Black Lives Matter removed uh, on Facebook's platform, wrongfully. LGBTQ content has been removed, as well as things like art and satire. According to Mishangama, social networks censor us in another way, too, by making us afraid to speak at all. It was actually the survey from 2020 by the Cato Institute which showed that 62% of Americans self-censor who are afraid to sort of express their political views on, on specific topics. And I think it shows this paradox. Americans enjoy the strongest legal constitutional protection of free speech probably in world history, but they still fear the consequences of being fired for speaking out on certain political views. And that's not a healthy sign. But it's not just America. Since 2019, at least 37 countries have passed laws that increase censorship of individuals or the media, including in Europe, where Jillian York lives. There's a lot of debate right now in Germany, for example, over a fairly recent law that restricts hate speech online, but also um, creates penalties for things like the country's insult law. So, you know, insulting someone online could be penalized financially. Overall, it would be easy to get depressed by these attacks on free speech, especially if you're a teacher like Jennifer Given. What's the end point for you if this keeps going this way in New Hampshire? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> There is a point where you start going, maybe, maybe I've had it. But if it cheers you up any, Jakob Mashangama points out that we still enjoy more freedom of speech than most countries. If we were having this discussion in Russia or Turkey, you know, someone would pick me up uh, when I go down on the street and, and you might not hear from me for a long time. He says that we should fight to maintain our freedom of civil discussion and never take it for granted. I'm not saying that free speech is just great and, and, and doesn't have any entail any consequences. It, it does. We should think about how do we mitigate misinformation? How can we ensure that we counter hate speech without compromising free speech? And, you know, it's an experiment, but I would argue that it's been a, a very beneficial experiment and one which is very much worth continuing.